chair on the side of the uh, Here, Sherry, sit right here. All right. Thank you. Sherry, sit. All right. Let's go. Jan, let's go. Okay. Well, you have to be sitting, Well, good morning. Everybody get some coffee and sugar and all that good stuff. Get that caffeine and sugar going, man. We're glad to have you here this morning. Welcome. We're another another great uh, great day here at the cottage. Jesus and Jeans worship at the cottage. If you don't have a have a seat, don't have some coffee, go ahead and get you some and find a place. We're glad to have you here today. My name is Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan, Jim, and Sandra Penner. This is our, our weekly ministry we do here and. Uh, we're glad to have you, especially if you're joining us uh, via the internet. When the technology works, it's just a, it's a really great thing. And uh, so when the technology works, it's all good. So if you're joining us, we're glad to have you. All right. We're going to do uh, some Christmas songs this morning. It is the Christmas season. And by the way, I want to want to make uh, an announcement uh, before we get started and before I forget. You know, old people, man, you know, this guy, you know, meant to make this last week. But tomorrow night at 6.30, we have our annual Christmas Eve service. And uh, so if you didn't put that on your calendar about three or four weeks ago when I said it, made, a, made mention of it, please do. And invite somebody to come with you, you know, because uh, we're expecting, uh, we always have a great crowd on Christmas Eve and uh, Easter sunrise. So, you know, th those are the two times a year that people will actually make plans to uh, go to a worship service. And so uh, tomorrow night's going to be your opportunity to invite somebody, and, and we hope you will. Let's do a little, uh, let's do a little worship this morning.
Jim, just a couple of moments here, and uh, he's got a got an announcement he wants to make. Do you need to? Uh, you need a mic? I don't think so. I'm pretty big mouth. Everybody, give it back to us. <laughs> so um, we we do this once a year, um, a little love offering for Jan and Teddy. Oh, um, none of this came out of the benevolence fund. I think we've helped uh, seven families this year um, out of your generosity to the benevolence fund. So thank you all very much for that. Um, Teddy and Jan, you know everybody in here loves you guys. Oh. We love y'all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we love you guys for who you are, but we especially love you for what you do for us and everybody out there every Sunday morning. So um, there isn't two separate envelopes this year, the Paradise Valley, which is usually about half of our little non-congregation. Um, but from all the Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Oh, no. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, we we are always humbled uh, by your your giving and your generosity. Not uh, really never to us it's it's what we do in the community that uh, really makes a difference and uh, like Jim said we we've already already helped seven families this year and and we still have a, a long way to go because of your generosity so uh, thank you thank you thank you so much we even uh, pledged to help uh, even with the um, the uh, food bank this year of trying to help them get a van so that they can minister to more families and uh, I mean we've done a lot of things I, you know I had this very myopic view of what we thought you know we could happen but because of your giving it it opens up opportunities to bless people and to bless families in ways that it just never ever ceases to amaze us and and it's like it, it, it's like the uh, uh, it's like the, I don't even know what what, the, what it's like, but it's like a well that never ends. You know, it's a, it, it, it's it's just keeps on giving. And I learned a long time ago, you can never outgive God. And uh, and the, again, the other thing is that your arms are too short to box with Him, so you might as well <laughs> go ahead and do whatever He's called you to do. And so, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our heart, especially for Jan and I. We do appreciate it. We want to pray today before we get into the message and uh, pray for what God's going to do uh, through our Christmas Eve service. It's, it's always a unique time because we're a unique place. There are uh, 
for the longest time, there was, there was not another vineyard or, or winery that holds a, a worship service. And now we have a, a sister winery uh, over, in, uh, over near Cartersville in the Canton area. It's called Big Door Vineyards. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, they started a worship service. And, and uh, so we're just, we're able to reach people in ways that, you know, that, that just the, the organized church, or the, the church building is not able to do. And uh, um, it's not that they don't reach people, they reach thousands of people every year. But for whatever reason, God is blessing this ministry and uh, the ministry that started over there is being modeled after what we do here. And, and it's just it's just so encouraging to see God doing a new thing in a new way. Uh, you know, we get a lot of we get a lot of flack because we're at a, at a at a winery. You know, but I said, you know, the communion is great. Tammy sits alone at the pastor appreciation thing, except for Catherine. <laughs> and uh, and it's just you know it's just a, a unique a unique thing that God is doing. And uh, I really don't care what people think or say about me it's uh, because really God gets the glory in everything that we do and uh, we're not ashamed of that and not ashamed of the gospel uh, we want to pray uh, continue to pray for Jim Connor any update on Jim is he doing any better he's not nice to you but he's not doing good yeah and well, we want to continue to pray for Jim and and Tom and Sherry as they uh, doing something similar to what we're doing you know when you get into that caregiving mode if you've never walked in those shoes it's uh it, it really is a journey for, for Kathy. She knows what it's all about, Kathy Villan. She's with her mom and having to deal with those issues as well. And we're still taking care of Jan's dad. And, uh, uh, and Jan's got some health things going on, so continue to pray for her as well. Let's go to the Father. Lord, we do thank you. We come with our stuff, and we ask you to bless it. But Lord, we already know that you're in our midst and that you hear everything that we say and you intervene in, in the way that only you can. And so, Father, we pray that, that you will and, and that you would meet every prayer request as we offer it up. God, in certain cases, there's, there's healing, there's comfort, there's peace of what we're going to talk about today. There's all these things that you already know and you're already aware of. And so we just want to agree with you that you are the source. You are where we need to come to find peace for our souls, to find healing for our bodies. We thank you for your word and the power of your word. Hide me behind it today, God, as we teach from Luke chapter 2. Such a, a wonderful story that we've told over and over again. But God still has the same power and impact because the results built a bridge to you. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for loving us. We pray your blessings today in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 Where we're continuing in our, our uh, Advent series is called The Calling of Christmas. We've looked at, at several ways that the calling of Christmas calls upon our lives to, number one, be prepared, to prepare our hearts for the coming again of Christ, to be joyful in, in that preparation, to be joyful in our faith and in our, our belief, to allow people to experience that. Then we talked about being real, to, to live authentic lives, to, to be able to allow people to see Jesus in you in a way that becomes contagious, becomes infectious almost, that as they see Jesus being manifested in your life in a very real and authentic way, it, it, it draws them to say there's something different about that person and I want to know what it is. Then today we're going to talk about uh, that the calling of Christmas calls us to be at peace. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 20 of the Christmas story. The question was once asked, if you could choose what you want most in life, what would you ask for? And the most common answer 
was peace. People want peace in their marriages, in their families, in their workplaces, in their, in their nation, in their country, in the world. Now, our country has, has some of the best medical and psychological treatment centers. Some of the highest educational institutions and worldwide communication abilities. Yet, with all of these things, most people are still without true inner peace. And the results are devastating. They result in broken marriages and split families and hatred toward one another, rebellion, financial anxiety. It leaves a country unsettled. And you see, the world as we know it will offer you peace through many forms of escapism. Drugs, alcohol, immoral relationships, constant entertainment. Peace is sought through all forms of hedonistic adventures, pleasure-seeking, self-satisfaction, positive thinking. And many people believe that peace is defined as the absence of trouble. They refuse to face the problems in their lives, believing that, that this is the road to finding true peace. The world, however, has never held the answer to true peace. True peace comes not from man, but from God. The message of the angels and the Old Testament prophets regarding Christmas is one of peace. But what are they talking about? What did they mean? <clears throat> Christmas is always the busiest time of the year for most of us, and it's anything but peaceful. Amen. Amen. <laughs> One lady wrote, A wise man said to me, The way to achieve inner peace is to finish all the things you've started. So I looked around the house to see all the things I started and hadn't finished. And before leaving the house this morning, I finished off a bottle of red wine, a bottle of white wine, <laughs> the Prozac, some Valium, some cheesecakes, and a box of chocolates. <laughs> you have no idea how good I feel. <laughs> well, that's definitely one road to peace. But I imagine that it will have worn off by the next morning. Years ago, uh, a story was told of an ancient Persian. He was a man named Ali Hafed. He owned a very large farm that had orchards and grain fields and gardens. And he was a, a very wealthy, contented man. And then one day, a wise man from the east told the farmer all about diamonds and how wealthy he would be if he owned a diamond mine. Ali Hafed went to bed that night a poor man. Poor because now he was discontented. He had lost his peace. Craving a mine of diamonds, he sold his farm to search for these rare stones. He traveled the world over, finally becoming so poor, so broken and defeated, that he committed suicide. One day the man who purchased Ali Hafed's farm led his camel into the garden to drink. As his camel put his nose into the brook, the man saw a, a flash of light from the sands of the stream. He pulled out a stone that reflected all the hues of the rainbow. The man had discovered the diamond mine of Golcanda, the most magnificent mine in all history. Had Ali Hafed remained at home and, and dug in his own garden, then a, instead of death in a, a strange land, he would have had acres of diamonds. Another writer defined peace like this. Peace is a conception distinctly peculiar to Christianity. The trap the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. 
And so fearing nothing from God and content with his earthly lot of whatever sort that is. It's a very powerful statement. Peace, a conception distinctly peculiar to Christianity. The tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content with his earthly lot of whatever sort that is. Colossians 3.15 reminds us, it says, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. 2 Peter 1, 12 through 15 says, Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it's right as long as I am in this body to stir up by way of reminder <clears throat> And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Peter thought it was very important to constantly remind people, constantly. We are creatures of habit as these human beings that we walk around, these earth suits that we walk around in. And we get caught up in a lot of stuff that goes in the ear hole. The problem is is a short distance. It's between these two things. <laughs> because one time, it's like my mom and dad, I tell you something, it goes one ear and run out the other. I wish that happened. But the reality is, is that it goes in either ear hole and it gets stuck right here in this little small region. <laughs> and we start building a belief system based on what goes in here. Positive, negative. This morning I want to challenge each of us to follow the instructions from the verses that I just read to you. From Colossians and from Peter. Today we have the opportunity to allow the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts as we listen to the scriptures from the Old Testament and the New Testament about Jesus' birth, we have that opportunity to allow the Word of God to remind us once again of how special this time of year is to each of us as believers in Christ. <coughs> Let everything we do be as representatives of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to him through God the Father. Luke chapter 2, and beginning in verse 8, it says this. There were sheep herders. This is from the message. There were sheep herders camping in the neighborhood. They had set night watches over their sheep, and suddenly God's angel stood among them, and God's glory blazed around them. And they were terrified. And the angel said, do not be afraid. Have you heard over the last several weeks that when the angel comes to visit, that's one of the things, first things the angel says? Do not be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A Savior has just been born in David's town. A Savior who is Messiah and Master. This is what you're to look for. A baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please him. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the sheep herders talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. 
They left running and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. And all who heard the sheep herders were impressed. Today, it's a rare find to find people who are truly at peace. It's easier to find people who are busy, amen? It's easier to find people who are stressed out, tired, burdened. But not many of us can look in the mirror and truly say, I'm at peace. And yet, God sent Jesus at Christmas to bring us peace. 700 years before Jesus, Isaiah predicted in Isaiah 9, 6, that a child has been born for us and God has given us a son. He will be called the Prince of Peace. Then in that first Christmas, the angels announced, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. Before Jesus went back to heaven, he said this in John chapter 14, verse 27. He said, I am giving you the gift of peace, the kind of peace that only I can give. It isn't like the peace that this world gives. The peace of this world is at best fragile and fake. And just like joy, it can be determined by our circumstances rather than relying on the peace that Christ gives us, which the Bible says is peace that passes all understanding. We, we can't even understand it. To, to have the peace of Christ Here's a fact. Some of you are frustrated. Some of you are tired and worried and stressed out. And if you are, then please take note of this fact. You're not here by accident. God wants to give you his gift of peace. And the calling of Christmas this year calls all of us to be at peace. So again, this morning, as, as we remember this time of year, open up your hearts and your minds to allow the true spirit of Christmas, the Holy Spirit, to gain access to yourself, to that inner being, that inner part of you who is connected to Christ with an eternal bond of love and peace. During this last Sunday of the Advent season, I, I, I just I want us to consider the kinds of peace that Jesus offers. There are three kinds of peace that I've looked at this past week. The first one is, is spiritual peace. The second is emotional peace. And the third is relational peace. That is eternal, internal, and external peace. The first one, well, before that, I, I want to remind you, there are, there are over 790 verses in the Bible about peace. The word peace itself is used over 400 times in the scripture. And we're not going to look at all 790 verses about <laughs> peace this morning, so you can take a breath on that one. <laughs> but I do want to try to summarize it for you. And the first is peace with God. That is the spiritual peace that Christ offers, offers us. And it's the most important because it affects everything else. If you have peace with God, it affects everything. It is the best trickle-down deal that you'll ever get in life. Because if you have peace with God, then everything else falls 
under that category. In 2 Corinthians 5.18 it says, God sent Christ to make peace between himself and us, the Trinity. Anytime I pretend to be God, anytime I disobey God, anytime I try to box with God, try to fight his will for my life, Anytime I try to interpret God's word without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that's why I, Bobby and Dawn and Jim and Sandra and I have a couple of other people that I, I give them permission to speak truth into my life. That if you ever hear me speaking about something that you feel goes against the word of God, then tell me about it. I open the door for any of you if you have a questions about what I teach from Scripture. If you have a question about it, ask me. Let's look at it together. Because I don't know everything uh, you know, about Scripture. I've been doing this for over 20 years. But I am not an exhaustive scholar of biblical theology. But my heart all the time is trying to teach and interpret the Word of God based on the Holy Spirit's inspiration in, uh, into what I read and study and research. But when I ignore that, when I ignore any of those things that I mentioned, when I ignore what God says to do, what I know in my heart that God is telling me to do, then that is an act, that is an open act of rebellion against God. It really is a revolt against his will for my life. And what happens in that is that it disconnects our relationship. It breaks that relationship that I have with God. Now, God's not up there saying, okay, Ted, that's it. You've done it now, Teddy, you're out. It's not that kind of break. It's a breaking of fellowship with God that God says, okay, Teddy, I'm, I'm here when you need me. So you go ahead and do what you want to do as long as you want to do it. And when you get tired of that, I'll still be here. But I don't move. I move. And that's what happens in our life. It, it is going against the will of God. And, and if you're a believer, that presence of, that's one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is that he is, is to guide us and direct us in the way that Christ would have us to live, in the way we go. But here's the caveat. God doesn't want us disconnected. That is the very reason that he sent Jesus, was to build the bridge between God and mankind. Romans 5.1 says, Since we are made right with God by faith in Christ, we have peace with God because of what Jesus has done for us. That's a very powerful word. D-O-N-E. In every other religion, you can look at them. Go check them out. I told you, I was one orange jumpsuit, a, you know, a good haircut and a tambourine from being with the Hare Krishna Atlanta Airport years ago. <laughs> I tried Scientology. I tried New Age religion. I had crystals under my bed, pyramids all around the house. I had wind chasers and, you know, uh, man, I was talking to the great Holy Spirit of the earth and the wind, the rain, the fire. and. Then earth, wind, and fire came out. I went, oh, man. Now I've got my musical spiritual thing going on. You know? I was out there, man. I'm young, or in Yekya. I tried Buddhism. And if it was out there, I was searching for it. And I was going to find it. But every single one of those relationships in that religion was all about D.O. It was what I had to do to reach nirvana. It was what I had to do to bring the offerings before the gods of Hinduism. It was what I had to do to become clear in Scientology. 
It was all about what I had to do to get there. But Christianity is what has been done for us. We just fight against it. It's D O N E. Can you say that with me? No. <laughs> I feel like a Southern Baptist preacher here. <laughs> but I love that about what Jesus did for us. It's done. All we have to do is receive it. Romans 5.10 says that even though we were his enemies, God made peace with us because his son died for our sins. Now that we're at peace with God, we will be saved for eternity by his son's life. Did you get that? It is the righteousness of Christ. I can never say this enough. It is the righteousness of Christ upon our lives that we accept what Christ has done into our hearts and our lives. We accept him as our Lord, our Savior, as the Messiah. It's whatever you label you want to put on it. But he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Done. You see, in many religions, even in Judaism, they are, are, they're used to practicing these peace offerings to God. They had to bring this peace offering to appease God. Well, that was a lot of Old Testament Levitical stuff that you can go look up in Leviticus. They, brought, they had a peace offering that people could bring before God. And it was over and above their other offerings that they did during the year. But when Christ came, when he came into this world as a little baby, in the simple way that he did it, all that changed. And we don't have to do that anymore because God did it for us. Hebrews 7, 27 says, Jesus sacrificed for our sins once and for all when he offered himself on the cross. One of the gifts that the wise men brought to baby Jesus was gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh was always in the Jewish tradition and in the old traditions back in those days, it was used in burials. Well, you think that's just a quinky dink? Well, that's a strange coincidence. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. I mean, I get the gold and the frankincense. We can all use some of that. But the myrrh? God ordained that gift because Jesus came to die. Jesus grew up as a young boy, a carpenter's son, learned carpentry, learned about Judaism, learned all these things with the knowledge of one thing. I came to die. I don't know about you, but that would drive me nuts. I came to die and I know how it's going to happen. I know when it's going to happen. I know why it's going to be happening. So I told you, y'all don't want me to be God. Because I wouldn't do it. I love all of you but there's some people out there I just wouldn't take a bullet for and I'll just tell you that up front that's why I tell you I'm not your role model let's go ahead and clear the air right now never gonna be because I'm one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread that's it The second thing is peace within me. That's 
internal and it's emotional peace. And the Bible calls this the peace of God. I want us to go back and revisit because Colossians 3, 15 through 17 have been my life verses for a long time. I used to, people used to ask me to sign something, you know, and I would give them a Bible or I'd give them, you know, a gift or something. Hey, would you, pastor, would you sign this for me? And, and well, of course, you know, my name means nothing, but what I'm about to put under it does. Colossians 3, 15 through 17. And it says this. It says, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in whose heart? In everyone else's around you? And, well, as long as everybody else has the peace of Christ, I'm, I'll be okay. No. It says, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you, underline exclamation point, asterisk parentheses around it, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Then verse 16 says, let the message about Christ and all its rich, richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And then verse 17. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. See, all of that, those are what I call imperative statements. You've heard me say that before about these scriptures. When you read anything in scripture that says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Put your name in front of it. Teddy, you let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. You are called to live in peace. As you teach and counsel each other, the message about Christ is to fill your life. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now, I don't do the best at that. I'm still human. I still have those thoughts. That's why I always tell you about the driving incidences, the visits to Walmart. The, <laughs> you know. And there are... There are tons of other things where I, I miss the mark and, 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 and the peace of Christ doesn't show up in my life. Someone really ticks me off or I read something or I watch the news or, you know, something happens and man, I just get home, you know. <laughs> and you see how I respond is, is the evidence of what's going on inside me. That's why people say, well, you made me mad. No, I didn't make you mad. I just yanked your chain. I just rattled your cage. The anger was already in there. I just stirred it up. So you can't be made mad. Well, that just made me mad. <laughs> no, that allowed the anger that was already inside me to come out. See, words are very important, how we say things. And this is inside you. This is the eternal, the emotional. The Jewish word for peace is shalom. And shalom is a, is a very broad word. But you know what that means to us? That God has a peace for every single problem that we face. 
The third way is peace with others. That's our relational aspect. And here's another fact, and you can see it in the world today. All you got to do is watch the world news for just a little bit. Here's a fact. The further we get away from God, the more conflict we have with others. Does that make sense to you? The further we get away from God, the more conflict we have with others. Because there's no filter. There's no litmus test. There's no plumb line in our life that says, hold on. The world is not becoming more peaceful. I know that's breaking news for most of you. <laughs> It's, it's becoming more splintered because of, of the secular effort to remove God from everything and every aspect of our lives. So how can we have unity when we're so different? Ephesians 2.16 says, Christ brought us all together through his death on the cross. The cross gets us to embrace each other and end the hostility between different groups. What a concept. That's the Bible. That's what it says. Galatians 3.28, in Christ's family there is no division between Jew and Gentile, slave or free, or even male or female. In Christ we're all equal and the same. We're all in a common relationship with Jesus. Three kinds of peace build on each other. Eternal peace with God leads to internal peace with yourself, which leads to external peace with others. Does that make sense? Eternal peace with God leads to internal peace with yourself, which leads to external peace with others. The late Presbyterian pastor, Bruce Larson, once told the story of how he helped people struggling to surrender their lives to Christ. He said, for many years I worked in New York City and counseled at my office any number of people who were, were, were wrestling with this yes or no decision. Often I would suggest that they walk with me from my office down to the RCA building on Fifth Avenue. In the entrance of that building is a gigantic statue of Atlas, a beautifully proportioned man who with all his muscles straining is holding the world upon his shoulders. There he is, the most powerfully built man in the world, and he can barely stand up under this burden. Now that's one way to live, I point out to my companion. Trying to carry the world on your shoulders, but now I want you to walk across the street with me. On the other side of Fifth Avenue is St. Patrick's Cathedral. And there behind the high altar is a little shrine of the boy Jesus, perhaps eight or nine years old. And with no effort, he is holding the world in one hand. My point was illustrated Graphically, he says. We have a choice. We can carry the world on our shoulders or we can say, I give up, Lord. <laughs> Here, here's my life. I, I give you my world. My, my whole world I give to you. You see, the, the old bumper sticker quote is really true. You ever seen that bumper sticker that says, no God, no peace? No God, K-N-O-W. No peace. The last part of the Christmas story tells us this in Luke 2, 19. It says, Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear deep within herself. The calling of Christmas calls us to be at peace. Tomorrow night, we'll once again gather to celebrate 
and share the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. We have heard this story many, many times. But between now and Monday evening, I want to challenge you to take it in again. To, to think about what it means. To treasure it and hold on to it. What has this child, this babe, to do with you? Do you receive him as God himself who came to save you? Do you seek to know him more? Do you want to worship him? Is that a natural part of the overflow of your heart? And again, I don't want you to give me an answer now. I want you to treasure and think about these things. Treasure up these things in your heart and your mind and think about them. And not just today, but tomorrow and tomorrow and the day after that for the rest of your life. You see, a lot of you have believed what's gone in here. But Mary said, the Bible says that Mary took these things and pondered them and thought about it. When the world tells you you're worthless, when your mom, your dad, your stepdad, your stepmom, whatever the situation, a relationship, an ex-husband, whatever it is that the world tries to throw your way and tells you you're not worthy, you're a piece of dirt. You don't deserve anything. Think about what God says about you. You're blessed. You're highly favored. You're a saint who sometimes sins. You're a child of God. You have royal blood flowing through your veins. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I have peace that passes all understanding when I choose to draw upon it. If God is for us, who can be against us? Ponder those things. There's one last verse. One last verse, verse 20. Don't want you to get this. The sheep herders returned and let loose, glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they had been told. You see, it's one thing to experience the Lord. The shepherds definitely did that. But they also shared the experience with everyone they met. And the Bible challenges us to share our experience with others. It's our responsibility to share our faith and our peace with others. Inviting someone tomorrow night is one way to do that. Dr. Philip Thrankill writes this. He says, when Jesus ascended to heaven after his mission on earth, the angels asked him, did you accomplish your task? Yes, all is finished. We have a second question, said the angels. Has the whole world heard of you? No, he said, not yet. Then what is your plan? And Jesus said, I have left 12 men and some other followers to carry the message to the whole world. The angels looked at one another and down on the earth and then back at him and goes, what is your plan B? <laughs> Friends, there is no plan B. We, as the body of Christ, as a community of worship and witness, the church and all its various local manifestations is the God-ordained means for drawing people to Jesus Christ and into the force field, if you will, of the kingdom of God. Again, I hope you're inviting somebody. I hope you make an effort to come and be with us. Because 
The way we should view our fellowship is this. We are a missions outpost where a divine transformation process takes place as we find people and by the alchemy of God's grace transforms them into credible witnesses to the power of Jesus Christ. We are not a waiting room for heaven. We're not a religious club. We are not the last bastion of decency and values. We are, are not the society for the preservation of the way things used to be. We are not a, a memorial club for a dead hero. We are not a place to hide from the, the big bad world. We are agents of a foreign government bent on winning this rebellious world back to its rightful ruler. We are agents of the kingdom of God dropped behind enemy lines to announce Jesus is the answer for the world today. He's the answer for real peace. He's the answer for pure joy. He's the answer for the hope that we seek. He's the answer for the love that we all desire. There is no plan B. Jesus Christ has put all of his eggs in one basket. And the label on that basket reads church a young mother alone and struggling needed some word of hope she needed help when her shift ended on christmas morning she went to her battered old chevy and it was still dark and she couldn't see clearly but something was in her car she opened the door cautiously to discover boxes of clothing and fruit food for her cupboards and toys for her children. A caring worker had told her plight to some of the regular customers and they pitched in to help. Her miracle had come and it, it was a, a message of love, help, and friendship. God has done so much more for you and me. He performed a miracle through a mother in a manger to deliver his message of love and hope. He didn't have to choose the lowly, but he did. He didn't have to leave heaven's glory, but he did. He didn't have to come to save us, but he did. He didn't have to suffer injustice, poverty, and rejection, but he did. He didn't have to give his life on the cross, but he did. And he did it for all of us. What a benefactor. <laughs> what a friend. He who came so lowly then comes to you in majesty today. He who gave his hands to the nails now gives his hand to you in friendship. And he says, come. Come. Will you take his hand? Because one day he's coming again. Not as a baby but as the king of kings. Are you ready to receive the king? 2 Thessalonians 3.16 says this. <laughs> now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy and the story of Jesus that never gets old. Father, help us to live that out in our lives every day. Help us to accept your eternal peace, your internal peace, and help us to share that external peace with others. God, you're doing amazing things in us and through us, and I never take it for granted. I'm always amazed and what we see you do. I pray that will energize us as a body, that we'll take that message and share it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless you.